Hi and welcome. My name is Ann Driscoll and I am the senior reporter for the Schuster Institute. Our founding director, Florence Graves, whose name appears in the program, was unfortunately unable to be with us tonight due to illness. But I want to thank you all for being here and I hope you'll enjoy the program we have planned for tonight. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank our co-sponsors. They include the Journalism Department, the Women's Studies Research Center, the Sociology Department, the Social Justice and Social Policy Program, the Legal Studies Program, the Office of the Provost, the Office of the Dean of Arts and Sciences, the Peace, Conflict, and Coexistence Studies Program. The Schuster Institute for Investigative Journalism was founded in 2004 by Florence Graves, and the Justice Brandeis Innocence Project was founded soon after. She believed that investigative journalism could make a contribution to wrongful convictions work in a way that the law couldn't. The traditional symbol of our court system has long been Lady Justice holding her, in her hands the scales of truth and fairness. She is also wearing a blindfold intended to represent objectivity. But as we have seen all too often, we have placed blind faith in blind justice and have been disappointed by the results. There is now a network of 60 innocence projects in the U.S. and more than a dozen abroad. In the 20 years since the first innocence project was started by Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld, there have been hundreds of exonerations based on DNA evidence showing that the criminal justice system is both flawed and fallible. In our experience here at the Justice Brandeis Innocence Project, and based on what we have seen among our colleagues who investigate cases where wrongful conviction is suspected, there is almost always a failure of the system triggered by a myopic rush to judgment and a lack of thorough investigation. Police and prosecutors eager to solve a case, perhaps driven by ambition or hoping to quell public outrage in a notorious case, or simply to obtain a conviction, have been known to find the facts and evidence to fit the theory of a crime and ignore the truth in the process. In these situations, everyone loses. The wrong person can be arrested and convicted, destroying their lives and upending those of their families and loved ones. The actual perpetrator remains on the street, free from being held accountable and free to commit other crimes. The victim's families have no true closure because the actual criminal hasn't been brought to justice. And the public's faith in the criminal justice, in criminal justice is understandably left battered and bruised. And ultimately, we have failed as a society to be fair and just. These failures have happened in every state in our nation. We know, for example, that people have been ex executed for crimes they didn't commit and were later exonerated. Look, let's face it. It is hard to admit when you're wrong. It's human nature. And this is particularly evident in the criminal justice system, too, in cases when even after DNA evidence has proven someone has been wrongfully convicted, it can be a Herculean effort to get the prosecutors and courts to release someone. Cases drag on for 5, 10, 15, 30 years or more. And we've also seen that even after DNA evidence identifies the actual perpetrator, Prosecutors might not pursue that person in court, especially if it means admitting a failure of justice and a financial liability to the state. So, why should we care? We should care because this could happen to any one of us sitting in this auditorium right now. And we should care because it already has happened to hundreds of innocent people. Here to discuss these issues with us tonight, we have Damien Eccles, recently released 
Arkansas death row inmate, his wife, Laurie Davis, who spearheaded the campaign for his freedom, Lonnie Suri, an advisor to Damien's defense team, and Erin Moriarty, a CBS reporter who has covered Damien's case over the years, both while he was on death row and since his release. We would like to begin, the pro to begin our program with a screening of the trailer from west of Memphis, the recently released documentary of Damien's case, directed by A.D. Bird, and by showing you a segment of Aaron Moriarty's interview with Damien on CBS Sunday Morning. <coughs> After that, we will have students from the Justice Brandeis Innocence Project lead a panel discussion with our guests. The students we have brought with us tonight are all graduating seniors who have been investigating wrongful convictions for over a year. We have Maddie Zip, Maddie, um, a majoring in psychology and business, Avi Snyder, who is completing an independent interdisciplinary major in philosophy, politics, and economics, and Keith Barry, who's majoring in philosophy. Before we begin, I would like to say that we have reserved 15 minutes of time for questions from the audience um, before Damien will begin signing copies of his books that will be available for sale at 8.30. If you would like to ask a question, please come to the mic here at the center aisle, and um, we ask that Everybody remember that these people are our guests, and we expect that everybody will have a civil discourse and will be respectful in their questions. So, can we start with the... Thanks. Nothing ever happens unless people sign in. We've had three children missing since last night. Three young boys murdered in cold blood. It appeared that they had been sexually mutilated. Is it your opinion that these crimes were motivated by a cult police? Yes. Arrested at 2.44 p.m., charged with three counts of capital murder. It was like a nuclear bomb going off in the courtroom. Life imprisonment without parole. Death by lethal injection. And the terror of mortal men looked favorably on my sacrifice. as opposed to one without direct evidence. I read the confession on the front page just like everybody else did. Jesse's born alignment was retarded. The statement was put in his mouth by the police. They beat up all three of them. And then they took their clothes off. Then they tied them. Then they tied them up. This case is nothing out of the ordinary. You're dealing with three kids, bottom of the barrel, poor white trash. Here's the state of Arkansas I'm refusing to let the truth shine on this case. My role when I wrote it was primarily to analyze the case, to see does it really fit the three people they have in prison. They are seeking merely the opportunity to have the fair trial they have never had. And the reason I'm hesitating, I'm trying to think if that's a question that I should be answering. I said, just between me and you, did you do it? He said, yes, and he went into detail. Jason told me how he dismembered the kid. Did Damien invite you to some meeting? A cult satanic meeting. I was a big liar, and I really was. I was doing a lot of LSD. I remember not knowing why I was doing what I was doing. This case is outrageous. Feeling funny in my mind. You're dealing with a horrendous crime. There's savage injury. It affects people and it warps their judgment. There's careers at stake, there's promotions at stake, there's agendas. I'm walking kind of 
DNA testing has been done, there is powerful evidence that points towards another suspect. The focus is always on the family, so that you start from there and you work your way out. He didn't voluntarily give us this DNA. We waited in the living room while he was in the bathroom, and that's when I took the cigarette butt out of the ashtray. It's not just new scientific evidence, it's new evidence. I'll give my life to know the fucking truth. Ms. Kelly's confession wasn't supposed to be injected into the second trial at all, but it was. There's nothing more poisonous than having a confession in the jury. If that allegation is poured out, they have to throw this case out. Burnett was wrong in the decisions that he made. Well, I had to fool with it for 18 years. No one wants to admit that they made a mistake. We don't believe the people of Arkansas are going to be satisfied until there is a new trial. The option to reopen the case was presented to him when he went, no. We found them guilty. We're done. We got 17 years invested in sticking to this story, and that makes it even harder. This is going to be a happy ending. This has got to be a happy ending for this. There are a lot of people in prison because of this. Not only is the state getting away with it, but the person who killed those three kids is still out there walking on the street. Is it still a case of crime and punishment? If the person being punished insists he didn't commit the crime. But if he is really innocent, why did he confess? Here's Aaron Moriarty in 48 Hours. Damien Eccles is proof there's life after death. I can only see it four, maybe five inches in front of my face without these glasses. Um, it's due to being enclosed in a very small space for so many years, your eyes are just like any other part of your body. If it doesn't get used, it starts to wither away. And that's what happened to my eyes. Do you mind taking them off for the interview? Can sure. you? Yes. But you can't see me very well? I can see that there's a person there. It's just color and movement. Just a little over a year ago, Eccles was facing execution on Arkansas's death row. You sleep on concrete, you walk on concrete, you sit on concrete, it wears the joints of your body out. You're living with death hanging over your head at any moment, and all of those things combined wear you down. And then, in August of 2011, after spending nearly two decades in Arkansas prisons, Damien Eccles and two other men were suddenly released as part of a highly unusual plea deal, which we'll explain later. Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse Miss Kelly are the West Memphis Three. In 1993, they were teenagers living in West Memphis, Arkansas, when they were arrested and later convicted of a horrific crime, the murders of three little boys. The community exploded. People were living in absolute horror, trying to keep their kids off the street, not wanting to walk anywhere by themselves at night. People lived in terror. There was no physical evidence connecting Eccles or the others to the killings. And in fact, since then, considerable evidence has surfaced that supports their innocence. But in West Memphis, a person with a partially shaved head, black clothing, and interest in the occult stood out. A lot of it was just the way I looked. And in a really small, extremely conservative, right-wing town, they say automatically, well, you must be a Satanist. Therefore, we don't put anything past you. We, the jury, after careful deliberations, have determined that Damien Eccles shall be sentenced to death by lethal injection. The trial was nothing, he says, compared to what he faced on death row. Most people have nothing like that in their frame of reference. Having to live every single moment of your life on guard, even while you're sleeping. You never go into a deep sleep. You always have to be ready for the next person that's going to try to hurt you. When I interviewed Eccles as part of a 48 hours report on the case, he was spending nearly 24 hours a day in solitary confinement. He kept daily journals, which are now part of a new book. 
After an Emmy Award-winning documentary about the trial was shown on HBO in 1996, Echo's life changed once again when supporters from all over the country began contacting him. Sometimes people have callings in life, and this was mine. And so you just, I couldn't not hear it. I couldn't not go. Lori Davis, a landscape architect living in New York, even moved to Arkansas to work on the case. I had to do whatever I could to get this man out of prison. That's what I had to do. And she wasn't alone. Johnny just called me one day, just out of the blue, just cold called. Hello, me. this is Johnny he Depp. Did, yeah. A and you said? I'd heard that he was interested in the case and that he was interested in helping. I'm so positive. Depp explained on 48 Hours why he and others connected to Echo's situation. He comes from a small town in Arkansas. I come from a, you know, relatively small town in Kentucky. As a teenager, as a kid growing up, I can remember being kind of looked upon as a, as a, as a, a freak, if you will, or, you know, different, because I didn't dress like everybody else, or because I didn't look like everybody else. And then in December 2010, with mounting evidence pointing to the innocence of the West Memphis Three, the Arkansas Supreme Court ordered a new hearing a hearing both costly and potentially embarrassing for state officials. And that brings us to the unusual plea deal. At this point in time, I want to proceed with the offered plea. The idea of Stephen Braga, a highly respected appeals attorney who volunteered his services. It's called an Alfred plea. Uh, it's basically a compromise where both sides, two sides that have been at war for 18 years in this case, decide that we want to end the case. In return for agreeing not to sue the state, the three men were released from prison. But here's the bizarre part. While they could continue to insist they were innocent, each had to plead guilty. Didn't it feel a little like a deal with the devil? It was a deal with the devil, but it was also a deal I really didn't have any choice but to take if I wanted to live. My health was going fast. I was dying in there. I knew if I didn't take that deal, I was never going to live to see outside those walls. You'll be sentenced to serve 18 years and 78 days on a charge of first-degree murder with full credit for that time already served. Do you believe the state would have let them out if any state official really believed that they did this? No. So it doesn't really add up to what people think of as justice. This is not a just result. This is a compromise result, a way for me to save Damien's life and get him off death row. But it's a compromise that you sometimes you have to hold your nose because it stinks a little bit because it's not justice. Echo's joy at his release after 18 years in prison was widely covered by the media, but not the fears that followed when he left Arkansas for a new life in New York City. It's just like this free-floating anxiety. I've been injected into this whole new world, and I'm having to learn everything. There's fear constantly, fear you're gonna get lost, fear you're gonna say the wrong thing just because you're not used to social interaction. It's the simplest things that most people would take for granted that he had never done before. Lori Davis went from seeing Eccles once a week to 24 hours a day. Yes, she married him in 1999 while he was on death row. I believed in his innocence and then I fell in love with him and those two things together, nothing else mattered. All that matters now, says Lori, is helping him adjust to a world that has moved on without him. Filling out a deposit slip, being able to go from one address to another and reading a map, He's never done any of those things. And does he become frustrated when he doesn't know things? He wants to be able to, to move about in the world on his own and not have to rely on me, and that's frustrating to him. But it'll come. And the reality is, 37-year-old Eccles may be out of prison, but he's not free. He remains a convicted felon. You're going to have a hard time getting a job. Exactly may not work with everybody and say, oh yeah, I was convicted of murder, but I didn't do it. Exactly. Which may explain why he spends so much time here. This is Sacred Tattoo Gallery. Among tattoo and graffiti artists. These are people who are sort of marginalized by society, who aren't part of, you know, the mainstream. These are people who tattoo people. They're not people who put on business suits and going to work every day. I see, though, that spending time with tattoo artists is rubbing off on you. It is.
Echo's notoriety is not likely to end soon. Besides his book, there is a new documentary coming out in December and a Hollywood movie in production. But this month, Damien and his wife moved to a town where they think they'll fit in just fine. Salem, Massachusetts, a town that knows too well the terrible consequences of misjudging people. Is there a time when you just want to be known as Damien Eccles and not one of the West Memphis Three? That's one of my driving forces in life right now. I want to do things that stand on their own merit, that people appreciate, that mean something to people, that move them in some sort of way. That's what I want to be defined by, not by what was done to me. So I'd like to invite Maddie and Avi and Keith to come up and start the question portion of the program. sign this agreement and you can go home today or before the week is out at least. You know, and like I said in, in the clip you saw a couple of minutes ago, my health was failing very rapidly. I was losing my eyesight. I weighed about 60 pounds less than I do right now. I was in a lot of pain. You know, they're not going to spend a lot of time and money and energy taking care of someone they plan on killing. So there's almost no medical care, no dental care, things like that on that road. And the prosecutor also says in the documentary that one of his, if not his one biggest concern in this case, is the fact that me, Jason, and Jesse collectively could have sued them for $60 million. And I knew they could have you stabbed to death for a pack of cigarettes in prison any day of the week. So I knew that one way or another, whether it was just failing health or violence or whatever it was, I knew that if I didn't take this deal, there was no way in hell I was ever going to see the outside of those walls again. Uh, next question is for you, Lori. I know you were talking about this uh, a little bit downstairs earlier, but could you just explain how you first got involved in Damien's case, why you first got involved, and how it became, as you just said, in the, as we just saw, how it became your life force? I saw Paradise Lost, um, the first documentary that was made about the case, in 1996. Um, I was living in New York City at the time, and um, I'm from the South but originally, so um, I understood the culture of what was happening, uh, or what had happened in West Memphis. Um, and I, I just felt a, a, an affinity for Damien, and I, I, I just knew, I knew something terribly had gone wrong in the case. There wasn't that much information out there at the time. 
to learn more about the case, but I just knew that something had gone wrong in that courtroom. Uh, so I reached out to Damien and uh, asked what I could do to help, and, it, and, we, and we started a correspondence. And um, I started sending him books and writing and back and forth. And then I decided to move to Arkansas to be closer and to start learning what I could about the case. By 1998, I was working on the case and it just went on from there. We were married in 1999. Um, the next question is for Ronnie. So you are a Damien's defense team advisor. Can you explain your role in Damien's case and how you actually got involved? Uh, sure. Uh, Laurie Davis, uh, who we call the CEO of Chief Executive Officer of Free the West Memphis Three, uh, had reached out to me because I had worked on a case in New York for uh, a young man named Marty Tankler, who was sentenced to 50 years to life for the murder of his parents. It was also a false confession case, which is really the underpinnings of Damien's uh, uh, wrongful conviction and Jesse's work on Jason and. and and, uh, and Jesse's wrongful conviction. Uh, and also in that case, we had, we had built a campaign of innocence, a campaign to get out to the public and our public audiences the innocence issues in the case, not just for publicity's sake, but for educating the public. As the prosecutor said about me, I had poisoned the jury pool in Arkansas. And what I said is we educated the public, so you know, under Lori's leadership, we really coalesced the investigative, we set up a tip line, we, we set up uh, a new investigation, uh, and with Peter Jackson and, and Fran Walsh, we had this sort of public outreach, public information, garnering support, not just from the legal community, not just from the Arkansas community, but really to change, change the hearts and minds. That was the only way we felt we could overturn this conviction, was to really change people's minds in Arkansas and to get the community behind us and that was the process that we, we engaged in. It was essentially, let's educate the public. Let them know about the new DNA evidence. Let them know that Terry Hobbs was with the three children immediately before they were murdered. People didn't know this. Let them know that Terry Hobbs' DNA was, was found in the knot that was used to bind one of the other children, not even his own son. Um, so that needed to get out. We needed to influence judges and lawyers and, and the, you know, the good old girls from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. When we reached out, we figured, and the elected officials. Um, before we move on, can you explain the situation with Terry Hobbs a little more? Sure. I'd like to help a little more. Yeah. Terry Hobbs was uh, stepfather of Stevie Branch, one of, the, one of the young boys who was murdered. And uh, he was never in, interesting. There was really no investigation in this case. So people ask, you know, how did they get to Damien? The minute they found the bodies, somebody said, this must be the work of Damien Eccles. So essentially that began the investigation into trying to convict Damien. Terry Hobbs, one of the steps father, was never interviewed by the police. I mean, most of the people in town weren't interviewed, so the police did no investigation. Um, in 2007, through the efforts of, of Fran uh, Walsh and Peter Jackson and an investigator, Rachel and Lori, they, they were able to get DNA, uh, Terry Hobbs' DNA. That was tested against the hair that was found in one of the knots used to bind one of the children. So all of a sudden, we had a connection. Now, did, we, we, don't, we, don't, we, we don't have a video of the crime, we don't know if Terry Hobbs did it, but certainly, it began to raise issues. We knew Damien Eccles' DNA wasn't there, Jason Baldwin's DNA wasn't there, Jesse Miss Kelly's DNA wasn't there, and then we also developed new evidence. So it became apparent, quickly, um, Three new witnesses came through our tip line that placed Terry Hobbs with the children immediately before they, they disappeared and were murdered. Uh, anecdotally, uh, we were then in, under, um, uh, involved uh, due to uh, uh, Natalie Maines, who was being sued by Terry Hobbs for defamation, to be able to put him under oath in a, in a deposition. And unbeknownst to Terry Hobbs, we asked him, did you see the children that day? And he said, no, I never saw the children under oath. So we knew he was lying. These three witnesses were impeccable, and Aaron Moriarty interviewed them. Uh, so we knew there was something fishy here, and uh, we moved in that, and that became part of our evidence and part of the evidence that pointed to others. There's more evidence against Terry Hobbs than there is against Damien Eccles. So. Aaron, could you tell us a 
a little bit more about how you became involved in the case and what specifically it was that convinced you that Damien was innocent? Um, I certainly didn't know that when I first started. Um, I, I'm fortunate enough, I work on a show called 48 Hours, and I'm fortunate enough that um, I can do cases where we believe there might be a wrongful conviction. But, but I don't always know that when I start off, and what interested me in this case is the cases I want to do the most are ones that don't involve DNA, um, or not initially, because those are the hardest cases, and you know, if the Innocence Project in New York gets a good case with DNA, they're going to do it and a reporter will cover it. Um, these are much harder when there isn't some immediate DNA. Um, these are the cases that have really interesting legal issues. And so what we liked about it, of course, was because part of what helped convict these, these three mm -hmm. men was the time, I even remember the 90s when there was this belief that there were all these satanic murders and Oprah and Geraldo, they were doing these stories and that added to this climate. So that was an interesting part of the case. Um, uh, the fact that you have these three young men, um, there's just no physical evidence at all to tie them to this horrific crime. They were young, so what, they commit this crime, they leave nothing, they take nothing with them. Um, and then as, of course, there was more and more, as Lonnie was talking about, more and more evidence that was coming out pointing to somebody else. So it's, to me as a reporter and a lawyer, it was absolutely the kind of case that I wanted to look at. It was after about the, after we really put our first hour on, that I really did come to believe, based on our reporting, that we did have three men who did not commit this crime. And then, of course, as a mother and a citizen, the idea that three young men, little boys, could be killed and the killers could still be out there, that was another reason why it really mattered to me to do a story like this and highlight a case like this. But to me, I'm all about just educating people about how the system can sometimes go wrong, important legal issues, and this one was just the perfect case for that. Um, Damien, we saw in the clip you talked about um, how it was, how you feel about the fact that you stood out in kind of a small conservative community. Uh, that that's why you were targeting all that was going on. But is is that all you feel it was? I mean, how is it that that the piece came to you? Where did these witnesses we heard come from? Who were they? Uh, how did how did they get to you? I had actually had run-ins with um, a segment of the police department for about two years before these murders ever happened. Uh, there was a branch of the police department that was supposed to um, police juveniles. It was a, uh, a small group of incredibly corrupt individuals, there were three of them. Um, they actually used to come through our neighborhood and pick up teenage boys and say, either give me a blowjob or you're going to jail. Eventually one of them was forced to resign after he was caught molesting a teenage boy. One of them went to prison in Florida when he was caught stealing from the police department. The other one was shot when he was caught sleeping with another man's wife. But it was these individuals, the day they pulled the bodies out of the water, they had been harassing me for two years before this. And as soon as they pulled the bodies out of the water, it was these individuals who told the West Memphis Police Department, we've got your guy over here, this is the one you need to look at. So they steer him in my direction. It was that combined with everything else, just not fitting into the neighborhood, being sort of the black sheep of the town. It, um, it was the perfect storm. Can I just add one little thing on that? Um, from working so many of these wrongful convictions, and I think Lonnie went backing up on this, there's always something a little, don't take this personally, off about the, you know a defendant that they can focus on. He's not going to be the all-American kid. Um, or he just won't act the way we want him to. Um, Marty Tankler, um, that Lonnie actually convinced me to work on that case, and that of another wrongful conviction. He just didn't act the way we want people to act. We were innocent. Um, and he, he had this you know, alleged confession. Um, so most of these cases, that's, I, I think it does contribute. In this case, Damien also had this 
environment. I mean, three little boys killed in this small town, and this talk about satanic murders and the full moon that night and all this. You know, people were panicked. Um, so when they pointed the finger, even there was absolutely no evidence at all to connect him in physical evidence or an investigation that led to him. It just was a way to put this community at peace. Um, but it's not unusual for someone like Damien to be focused on in a case like this. I, of course, disagree with Aaron. That, <laughs> <laughs> that I think what happens, and in, in the word wrongful convictions happen, because the police are very effective and actually more prosecutors in finding out what the things that they will feed to the media, feed to the public, you know, and it could have been anything. I mean, in Marty Tankliff's case, he was, a, he was the son of a rich person. So he was spoiled. He killed his parents because he wanted their money. Uh, and Damien, Damien was a little, was different. He wore black clothes. I think what happens is they utilize whatever they can. So it's not necessarily, I disagree, that the victim contributes to him, to, to the wrongful conviction. But in fact, the police and prosecutors find a very, and they're very clever, find a very effective way. In every wrongful conviction, everybody acts strange. Every 18-year-old who's arrested is, is at odds and has no support. In Damien's case, and you can tell it better than I did, he didn't have good lawyers, he didn't have lawyers. He didn't have family, he didn't have people supporting. Anything would be taken, and the police use it very effectively. It's used with the juries, and uh, it convinces them. You know, Marty was a spoiled kid, that's why he murdered his parents. Damien was, you know, a, a kid who had some run-ins to the police, that's why he murdered the three little boys. Yeah, but in the case of Marty, the reason why he was convicted by a jury was because he didn't act the way people wanted him to. And that's not he was a 17-year-old, 19, when he was on trial. I'm not saying he's contributing to it. I'm just saying that people that... He didn't that cry had, when he was in, you know, everybody well, has this, You're supposed to cry when you're in front of the jury. If you don't cry, it means maybe he was unemotional. You know, like people are allowed to be who they are, but it's used very effectively by the prosecutor. You know, so that if, he, if he cried too much, he was crazy. You know, if he didn't cry enough, he was unemotional and therefore a sociopath. So that's, I think they, they use it very effectively. Whatever you don't do, you know, the, you know that's the reason. So. <laughs> um, just as kind of a quick follow-up, I, I know that certainly from the work we do uh, with these and Innocence Project, we all, what you often see in these kinds of cases is not just sketchy police work and sketchy police men, but sketchy witnesses who come out of nowhere. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of talk about who were these people, where did they come from? To be honest, I don't know. I mean, you had a lot of fruitcakes in this case. <laughs> you know, people that, um... Vicki Hutchison, okay, one, for example, there was a, a woman named Vicki Hutchison, the one you see in the clip that says, I took her to these, uh, satanic orgies where she saw people eating dogs and what have you. Um, she later came forward and said the reason that she said this is because uh, she didn't want to go to jail. She had commit, committed credit card fraud. And the police brought her into the station and said, um, either you can help us out or you can go to jail. So that's, that's what that ended up being. It was just uh, coerced pressure, you know, she comes back now and, you know, admits she lied and says she feels horrible about it, but it doesn't really give you 18 years back. Yeah. I don't know how many uh, accounts of teenagers that, the, that I saw that uh, reports where it was, you know, my cousin Tilly saw her friend Margaret down at the river and Damien was down there doing some, there was one particular um, statement that was made by a young man who said he saw Damien kill a Great Dane and bash its head in. And this, this same young man came to us after Damien was released and said, I, I never said that. The cops had me signed a truant. I was out of school that day. The cops came and fi found me, had me sign something because I was truant. It turns out it was that statement that had been written, you know, written, that the cops had written sign this kid's name to it. Things like that happen all the time, and it, it haunts cases. It's really, it's really unfortunate. Um, so an important issue in this case, and what perhaps a confusion for some people, is the Alfred plea. So, Lori, could you um, explain why you think the state of Arkansas chose to use the Alfred plea rather than release the exonerate data? 
I believe it all comes down to money and politics and careers, basically. Um, we had been fighting this case. The, the Supreme Court of Arkansas had finally, after many, many years of, uh, of us going to the um, original trial court, the same judge who had, overheard, who had overseen Damien's trial, kept denying, denying, even when we had new evidence. But then when we put it to the Supreme Court, they granted a new hearing, which would include ev ev all, all the evidence, even evidence from before the trial, anything that we had found, and anything that we would come upon in the future. So they were extremely generous in their decision. The state knew what was coming down the pike. They, they knew the pressure that was on them. And you know, Lonnie was so successful in keeping the media involved and interested. And it was just five, and the, and the state kept pushing the hearing out. It was supposed to, it was first it was supposed to be in the spring, and then it was going to be in July, and then it was going to be in December. And five months out, they approached, you know, they, we, it, it, this, right, we approached them, and they were very willing to put together this plea deal. And as Damien was talking about, and the prosecutor is interviewed in our film, West of Memphis, and he does say that, you know, the, the state was up for $16 million, possibly, and I believe they knew they were going to lose. Um, and I believe that a lot of political careers hinged on this case. So many, the, the, the original judge is now a senator. The, uh, everyone has climbed up the ladder from this case. Uh, so, and, and, and I think it's still, it's still, they're still concerned about it. But um, I don't know if they realize that we're not going away. <laughs> it also allows them, uh, one thing, it also allows them to also still say, to this very day, um, well, you know, no one has ever in the history of the entire state of Arkansas been exonerated from death row. Never. So this also allows them to say, and they still do say in paperwork that they file now, that the state of Arkansas has never, ever in its entire history sentenced an innocent person to prison. Uh, it's really interesting, but the night before Damien got out when the deal was, uh, I got a call from our attorneys in Washington and they said, get up to our Jonesboro meet with the prosecutor and try to give him the words to explain what he's doing. And I spent an hour and a half with Scott Ellington, who is in the film, trying to explain to him what he was doing and why he was, and how he could explain it to the public, because they really wanted us out of town. In fact, the Attorney General, uh, when, he was, when, he, when they were negotiating this deal, said, well, how can we get rid of Lori Davis? Those words came out of his mouth. And what he meant was, how do we get rid of the kind of attention, the kind of really bad press, and the awareness that, that these men are innocent and something terribly wrong happened. And they, you know, listen, they got away with it. It was a deal with the devil. But as Damien said, I'd rather be fighting for my innocence off of death row. Um, how, how was the Alfred plea uh, received in the community? In the, in, the, in, the, in the legal community or in Arkansas? Well, I think, you know, there's been some polls taken, and about 50% of the people uh, support uh, the Alfred plea, 50% uh, say they're, they were against it. Part of those were against the fact that Damien had, and Jason and Jesse uh, accepted, had to accept it, that they weren't completely exonerated like they should have been. Um, unfortunately, it was, uh, you know, we couldn't quite get there, and uh, Damien would likely still be in prison today even if he won his court case because of, so it was a vehicle to get out. And uh, I think people, you know, I think we had changed enough minds in Arkansas that we believe the majority of people in Arkansas believe that something terribly wrong happened in this case. Most people don't know the details, even now they don't know the new evidence. And, but, you know, we got, we built tremendous support. Also, you know, two of the parents, Pam Hobbs and, and Mark Byers, they were against the Alfred plea because they felt Damien shouldn't have to accept it. They thought he should be freed. Um, Danny, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, I just one more. Just, uh, <laughs> and uh, Lori, why, why do you think they haven't pursued a case against Terry Hogg, despite the DNA evidence? There's absolutely no interest for them to do that. It, it's not in their interest to do it. Um, because as far as what they've put out to 
the uh, Arkansas people is that the case is finished and the prosecutor says these people have pled guilty. I know they're guilty is what he says. So it's, it would not serve in their interest to, per, to um, proceed in any kind of investigation or to try to prove who actually murdered these children. Lonnie, to follow up what you and Lori were saying about maybe saving political face and political careers, you've quoted Damien in the past as saying that he ended up convicted because of ambition. Do you agree with that? Why or why not? Well, yeah, he was, we were asked, Damien was asked um, by a group of lawyers, of what, how did he get wrongfully convicted? And I thought he was going to go into this long explanation of how this stuff happens. And he used one word, ambition. And I don't think people really understand, as Damien said, it's true. Every prosecutor in the United States is an elected official. And about 50% of the judges, I don't know about Massachusetts, certainly New York and Arkansas, the judges are elected officials. So they are very attuned to political parties, political decisions, fundraising. Uh, and it's, it, and this, you, know, you, know, you don't get ahead in the prosecutor's office by freeing an innocent man. Uh, it is just ingrained, uh, you know, sorry to say, that most most prosecutors have very little interest in, in not getting a conviction. Uh, once they put their, their, their uh, uh, attention on somebody like Damien or whomever it is, whether there's a false confession, whether there's DNA attached to somebody else, they're going to put that through. The Central Park Jaga case is one great example of even when the prosecutors finally over... It was the prosecutors that finally overturned that conviction. The police still to this day say, well, maybe some, maybe they were still involved. So it's, it's, they're so reluctant to, to admit it, not even for, you know, finan for ambitious reasons. Can I add one thing on that? I think it also they're worried about opening a can of worms with other cases. In this case, there were a lot of mistakes made. Um, just the, really one of the underpinnings of the case was based on bad medical evidence and, and bad science and so you have that in this case and you're going to have a lot of defense attorneys coming out going well you know that same coroner did my did this case and did that and so some of it's just being practical some of it they don't want to admit they were wrong um i i think it's all of that it's not all just ambition it's just saving covering their ass too Um, Aaron, you've, you've worked on a lot of cases like this, and, and I think we have a, a, a better understanding of, of what the storm was that kind of created this case of the West Memphis Three, but do you think there's, there's a pattern that creates cases like, like this? Do you think there's a perfect storm in general for, that can create the circumstances that could lead to this kind of wrongful conviction? Well, yeah, not, it's not true in all cases, but I, I have to admit I was kind of joking about a case I'm working on now. His name is Damon Thibodeau, and he just got up out of Angola after 17 years. And I felt like I was just on this story already with a different name, because it was Marty Tankler. Young guy, happens to, nobody really knows him in the community, so he's kind of, and he's quiet, you know, nobody knows him at all. Um, a young girl gets killed, the cops question him, they put him in a room, this is a guy who then admits to me, I was going to say anything to get out, because I knew that my evidence wouldn't be there, so I'd be okay. So classic case of where he's going to say anything to get out after, what is it, 18 hours or something that he was in with the cops. Um, the cops, they think they know about the case. Again, they're, they're not starting off as bad guys. They know a certain amount about the evidence, so they create this this confession with all these facts that are completely wrong, um, that don't match the crime scene at all, but then once they're stuck with that confession, then everybody does what they can to back that up. And that just seems to happen in so many cases. Um, you, you know, I don't want to generalize, but that's, I have to tell you that the Damon Thibodeau case, makes it, it's exactly Marty Tankwick except New Orleans. Marty Tankwick was New York and rich. Damon Thibodeau was poor and New Orleans, but otherwise I feel like, God, I've already done this story um, with different faces, different characters, but um, that's pretty common, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Um, Damien, you've had a lot of celebrity support. Johnny Depp, Marilyn Manson, Peter Jackson, Eddie Vedder, etc. 
Um, how important was that support in getting attention to your case? It was extremely important. I mean, I would literally be dead right now without it. You know, a, a lot of people in the public, you get this idea from TV that just because they come up with new evidence, you know, new DNA evidence or new eyewitnesses or whatever it is, people think it's an open and shut thing. You know, they see it on TV and they say, okay, well, this guy's going home now. And that's, that's not the case. You know, that's only 50% of the fight. They've had people in, in Arkansas that uh, the DNA at the crime scene did not match them, but they executed them anyway, just to keep from having to admit they made a mistake. The other half of the fight is uh, getting people to care, getting word out to the general public. And a lot of times you can't do that yourself. You know, Lori and I couldn't do that um, just because most people weren't interested in what we had to say. But then when you have someone like Johnny Depp who's willing to step up on your behalf and speak, people will stop and listen to what he has to say when they won't listen to you. And in the end, that's a huge part of what got us out. We didn't get out because they realized they screwed up. We got out because they realized they were being watched, that people were paying attention to what they were doing and that there were going to be political repercussions to it. And without public awareness, without media attention focused on it, that would not have happened. You know, so we don't talk about this, but I think the fact that the prosecutor in the case became a judge, Fogelman, and he ran for then ran for the Arkansas Supreme Court, and we defeated him. <laughs> it wasn't part of our 501c3, so <laughs> don't tell anybody. We're not supposed to. But we we engaged in a effort, and we ended up meaning you know the folks in Arkansas defeating him for the Arkansas Supreme Court. I think that sent a very strong message to the politicians in Arkansas, including the Attorney General who was about to run for governor, that we weren't going away. You know. Lori, do you think that you could give us some insight on what it was like to deal with the media attention, both positive and negative? Well, personally or for the case? Pardon? Personally or for the, just generally for the case? Personally. Personally, it's, it's, it's difficult. I'm not, I, I wasn't one, I mean, I went to Arkansas in 1998 and and asked to stay behind the scenes. I didn't want to, I would sit in the back of the courtroom. I would, I just didn't want to be that person out in front. And it wasn't until 2007 when the new evidence was discovered that we realized that there needed to be a public face um, on the case. And I, it was, it's hard for me. And it, it's easier now, but I still have a hard time with it. I think Damien did an amazing job with I mean, he did interviews from prison, and that's very difficult to do. First of all, from uh, just the fact that there's a great pressure from the administration, from the warden, from the guards that are coming down on him all the time for speaking out. That was difficult for him, and of course, it was stressful for me because I was worried for his welfare. Um, but at the end of the day, once we started getting the attention, once things started to shift in Arkansas, uh, 48 hours was the turning point for us when, when that aired. People started coming up to me at my job and people I didn't know saying, you know, my mom works at the, at the governor's office and she believes in the case. So the media became very positive for me and I saw that there was great um, merit in, in doing it and speaking the truth even though Sometimes I get questions I didn't much care for, but it, there's always ways to get around that. Uh, I think the media was tremendously helpful um, toward the end, and, it, and helpful in, in procuring their freedom. Um, on that subject, Erin, um, do you think the media does an adequate job of covering wrongful convictions? And does the media have responsibility to cover such topics? <coughs> Um, I don't, but um, I, I don't think the media does a good job of covering cases in general. Um, before this started, we had a little bit of a discussion um, about the Casey Anthony case. Um, and one of the students 
said the media had decided she was guilty. And I said, no, it was the lawyers, because I don't count Nancy Grace as the media. Um, <laughs> I don't. I, you know, I mean, she brings on these lawyers and they decide, and that is so damaging to a case like Damien. So scary to me as a reporter. Um, if I don't know, I mean, that's why I don't think it just should be wrongful conviction cases. I'll take any case that has really interesting legal issues. And I may not know whether someone's guilty or not. Most of these cases you don't. They're really hard. There wasn't a good police investigation. Maybe there isn't any DNA. But it is my job to talk about the evidence in the case and, you know, both towards innocence and towards um, guilt. I kind of see my job actually as, I always say I have a defense bent, but I don't really mean that. What I mean is if we really believe in that concept of innocent until proven guilty, I have to put the prosecutor really on, in the hot seat. And sometimes it's really difficult to do. You can't get that evidence before trial. So that is really what my job is. So I don't think it's just wrongfully convicted cases because, you know, who knows all until you've really got involved in it. But I don't think the media does, and I mean the mainstream press or someone like me or even the, the folks who do cable um, every night, I, we don't do a good job of, of really talking about the issues in the case. Casey Anthony's case was a fascinating case and should have been done the right way, which was, oh my gosh, you know, she was overcharged in that case. Um, we don't know how that child died. How do you convict someone of murder if you don't know how somebody died? No matter how you feel about the defendant, that was what should have been really reported instead of pointing the finger at that young woman um, all the time and you know showing her dancing with her friends. I mean, that, that's evidence too. But um, that's where I think we fail, is that we just don't cover the legal issues, cover trials properly. I would say it's really hard to get the press to cover a wrongful conviction before it's declared a wrongful conviction by the court. Everybody wants to interview the guy when he gets out of prison. You know, it's uh, because it's safe. Oh, he's out, and, uh, but before is a struggle. Uh, when I first started working on this case, my first call was to Erin. <laughs> and I can't thank Erin and, and her colleagues enough for what they did on this case. And they never promised to say we're gonna do the right, we're going to do the right thing or agree with you. I just knew that they would be as objective and that is all we ever asked for. I then called up the New York Times and the New York Times national editor said to me, we're not going to write about this case because they made a movie about it. And I said, they made a movie 12 years ago. So it's really a struggle to get coverage, it's really a struggle to get a journalist that they don't have time, they're not interested, it's really, it's a fight, everything. We were lucky in many ways because we had some local press that the major paper in Arkansas wouldn't touch this case. In fact, they were completely negative right up until even after Damien got out. And the only reason I didn't scream at him was because I thought we may need him. But the, there was a local paper, the Arkansas Times, and a group of reporters there who just were incredible, and that set the stage. Uh, but it's a struggle. You know, every time you open up the newspaper and see an article about somebody who was freed, you know, it's likely that somebody was trying to get a story beforehand, but they, they couldn't get anybody interested. Um, Aaron, you mentioned before presumption of innocence, and I know when I, was a, when I was a kid, we all learned that we have a system where you're innocent until proven guilty, and I think we've all heard the, the saying, better ten guilty men go free than that one innocent person uh, be convicted. But I, when you hear about cases like this, about the West Memphis Three, and about all the other things we've been talking about, I, you get the sense that it's in fact much easier to convict someone than it is to exonerate them, that once the person's on the stand, you know, part of their sentence is, they're already sentenced on us. So, um, I mean, I have this question down for a lot of it, I think anyone here could speak to it. Do you think that's true? Do you think it's easier to convict someone than, than to not? Well, that's a hard one. I mean, it depends on the case and how much evidence, I will say, that once somebody's convicted, it's so hard to overturn that, um, and that's the problem. Um, but I think that, I mean, that's a tough one. I mean, I don't, th I don't think that, um, I, I would have to say just that have people feel better. I think most of the cases I cover when someone's convicted, 
that's the right decision. I mean, this is a, a small percentage. What would you say? One, two? Well, there are two hundred, there are two and a half million people in prison just today. If you said maybe 5% are wrong, the federal government at one point did a study and came up, even if 5% is 125,000, there are 3,800 people on death row. You know, 5% would be 150, 160. That's a lot of lives. That's a lot of people and a lot of families. That's a lot of people in our community who the, the, the guilty is still out in our community. So it's an overwhelming number, even at 1%. At 1%, it would be 25,000. That's a lot of lives. But still, the majority of people, I think, that cases go right. And if they go wrong, it's, you know, laziness on the part of prosecutors. It's, it's the blinders that cops sometimes wear. It's bad legal work um, on the trial level, which you're so screwed if you have that. Um, so there are all these kinds of things that contribute to a bad trial. Poverty, race, all the things. It happens all the time. It happens today. We really haven't learned a lot. Uh, in terms of prosecutors and police. Uh, so it, it's a struggle. And once you're convicted, it's virtually impossible to be free. Damon, can you tell us what your reaction is to people who still don't believe that you're innocent? And also maybe elaborate a little bit more on whether that reaction has changed over time throughout this process as you've been in prison and now released. Be honest, I don't have uh, much reaction at all. I see y'all smirking. Um, <laughs> it's because somebody asked me that before we came out here. They said, you know, what do you say to people who still think you're guilty? And I said, fuck them. Um, but I mean, in reality, the reason I say that is because it's because, um, you know, if you've got all this evidence now, if you've got DNA evidence, if you've got eyewitnesses, if you've got all this, and people still don't accept that, then they're certainly not going to accept anything that I have to say to them. So, you know, I'm not going to waste my time arguing or debating or anything else. So, there's just, I guess, too much life out here to enjoy. You know, I lost almost 20 years of my life, and I'm trying to make up for it. I don't want to spend the next 20 years looking back, talking about something from the past. I'd rather just move forward. Uh, so, I really just tend not to focus on people like that. Is that the same reaction that you had when you were initially convicted, or has it taken you a while to develop that? No, uh, when I was initially convicted, I mean, you've got to keep in mind that I was like 18, 19 years old. I was still a kid. So, you know, if someone says something to you at that age, you're still naive enough to think that they actually want to have a conversation. They actually want to have some sort of debate. You don't realize yet that they're really just wanting to call your name, pretty much. Um, so it did change over the years. You know, in the beginning, uh, I would try to justify myself or try to explain things to people. And then, you know, as time went on, I just realized it doesn't matter. Um, Lori, I'm, I'm told that every uh, marriage has challenges, but I imagine there are some unique challenges. Um, you get married to someone on death row, and that's when we need to good speak with that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, it's expensive, it's challenging, it's uh, stressful. But, you know, Damien's an extraordinary person, and I wouldn't, I've never regretted marrying him, uh, being with him now. And it's, it's, it, it's probably one of, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. <laughs> but then, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, it's, I, 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 I'm a little bit flabbergasted by the question, but, um, <laughs> but it, and it also comes with a lot of challenges uh, when, when he got out. I mean, no one knew what to expect, and uh, I would say the first six months that Damien was out of prison, I didn't have the slightest idea what he was going through, and I didn't have the slightest idea what to do for him. And it probably was six months in that he was finally able to explain to me that every single day he was scared to death, he was filled with anxiety, he didn't know what to do, and he's not going to come to me and ask me to fix that. Or to... So it was at that point I realized that you know, perhaps we shouldn't have him jumping off cliffs, cliffs in New Zealand or you know, <laughs> all the crazy things that we were... And I shouldn't expect him to be able to move about in the world the way that we all expected him to. Um, 
So the challenges are just constant, but there's also been a great deal of depth and learning and understanding, and um, for that I'm very grateful. Um, Bing, do you also I guess, I'd speak to, to the challenges and the rewards of, of you know, which you were married and, and what's happened since you've been released? Whenever I was in prison, um, people always asked me what it was that kept me going, the things that kept me from giving up, and really, it was two things. It was my spiritual practice and it was glory. Those are the things that took me out of that environment, allowed me to go for days at a time without even thinking about the prison situation. It, it gave me something else to focus on. We created a world together while we were, while I was in there. We didn't look at it as if one day in the future we're going to have a life together. We looked at it as if we are together right now and this is our life. It wasn't always fun. It wasn't always easy. <coughs> But there were times that were fun. There were, you know, it was Lori that would keep me laughing. I was in what really amounts to hell a lot of times. I lived in hell, but every single day she would still find ways to make me laugh at things. And I don't think I'm normally the type of person that laughs a lot. So, you know, that was kind of hard in itself. Um, it, it's kind of, it's been difficult even since I've gotten out, just because when you get out, people expect you're just going to be, you know, happy and excited that you're out. You are, but at the same time, you know, there is an extreme amount of shock and trauma that comes with it. You know, not only had I been in prison for 18 years, I had been in solitary confinement for almost the last 10 of that. So whenever I got out, you know, to say that it was overwhelming being out here um, doesn't even come close to articulating what it was like. I could not function for the first several months that I was out because I was in such a deep state of shock. And even then, even when she didn't know what was going on, it was still Lori that was getting me through a lot of it. It's, uh, you know, when we look back on it, we can always learn things in hindsight. And like Lori was saying, there was, you know, people just expected me to be okay. And they would do things, you know, like try to cram Eight, like when we went to New Zealand and Peter Jackson is trying to cram 18 years of lost time into a few months. And, you know, I always tell people Peter Jackson is literally, he's the smartest person I have ever come across in my life. But he's also crazy. <laughs> so when we were there, he would do things literally like he thought, okay, this is going to be a great idea. Today we're going to uh, go paragliding. And, and literally they would strap a parachute to me me off the side of the cliff, or, you know. <laughs> and I'd only been out of prison for like a month at that time. <laughs> or, or uh, you know, we, we would go immediately from that to taking a helicopter ride into an active volcano. <laughs> so there was a lot of challenges in the beginning. As time goes by, I've been out for about a year and a half now, and as time goes by, I adjust to it a little more and a little more. There are still days when it's really hard. There are still situations where it's really hard. But I think eventually um, I'll fight my way through it and have a normal life again. So, um, Lonnie, I'm, I'm wondering about the challenges on the legal end. What would you say was the most challenging aspect of the work you did on behalf of Damien? And can you maybe point to any particular moment that was most challenging, emotionally, legally, or otherwise? It's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, it's my feeling that there's never enough evidence to overturn a conviction. That no matter what you have, you need more. We need, and, and that's the challenge in every wrongful conviction. You need to overwhelm the court, you need to overwhelm uh, the system with, with innocence. And, and that's why it, it, it sort of never ends. Because there are so many cases, and Aaron has worked on a few, where everybody said, oh yeah, they'll get out, you know, then the case will be overturned. And in that fact, you know, the judge loses, you know, the judge, you know, loses their courage at the last minute and they keep the person in prison. So that, I think, is the biggest challenge, is also to focus on the investigation, that it never really ends. And also uh, to really push the attorneys as well, you know, because they need to be pushed to get more evidence, to, to not be satisfied that with their case. Uh, especially appellate attorneys, I think there's a, you know, there's a lot of issues, they go to court, they're trying to convince a judge that there was ineffective counsel, 
Well, that, you know, I mean, very few people get out of prison because of ineffective counsel, even when their counsel's asleep during, or, or having an affair with the judge. They still keep, and these are true cases, they still keep them in prison. So I think that's the biggest challenge, is just needing to overwhelm the court with innocence and the public. Well, I want to thank Maddie and Avi and Keith for these insightful and compelling questions. And we're going to open it up now to the audience. I would invite anyone that would like to ask a question to come up to the microphone in the middle of them. Them are of politically motivated prosecutions happening like during election years or just randomly during. Yeah, I don't think they're politically motivated prosecutions. I think the prosecutions become, the issues become political, the need to convict, uh, the need to dispatch of the case, to move it along, uh, is influenced by the public. You know, I mean, we, we hate to say, but cases are all public cases, cases that have a profile where the judge uh, or the prosecutor will be quoted. They, they very much understand. I often advise clients, even in civil cases, that the federal government will have a press release out before they tell you that you're innocent. Uh, so these are vehicles for prosecutors, district attorneys, to get attention to cases. And uh, so in that respect, it becomes very political uh, and high profile cases. In other cases, it's, you know, let's, let's get a conviction and move on to the next case. But I don't think that there are some political prosecutions, certainly. But uh, most are, you know, just part of the system. Hi. Uh, I would like to ask a question. Um, so, the prison system as a social construct is in inevitable, and we know that uh, in, in the United States, and the people who are incarcerated, it tends to be based on oftentimes race and class, and we've seen so much with this case and all these sorts of things. Would you say that prisons are, are obsolete? What are your thoughts on prisons? Uh, you know, 80, most people in prison are there for drug offenses. I mean, we have a, a drug war. Uh, you know, uh, it's amazing what that our, our you know state of incarceration. Uh, I, I personally believe only the most violent, only the most you know dangerous, and that's a really small percentage. Um, I think Damien says the people on death row either were crazy or they came or they were driven crazy. So yes, this, the system is very broken. And it's a, it's a part of our economic system and something has to be done. We need to change drug laws, we need to, to, to influence judges, uh, we need to do something about the state of incarceration in the United States. I think, you know, it's, um, prison in itself may not be obsolete, but the way we're doing it is obsolete. You know, it, really we have to focus more on rehabilitation and not punishment. You know, you have to keep in mind that only a tiny, tiny fraction of people who are sent to prison are going to be there for the rest of their lives. You know, just, just, just a tiny piece of the population in prison are the ones that are going to be on death row or the ones that are going to be spending life without parole in prison. The vast majority will one day be getting back out. You know, they'll be in your schools, they'll be in your churches, they'll be living in your neighborhoods. So it's probably not a good idea to be driving them insane before you bring them back out into the world. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of politicians now that give lip service to rehabilitation out of one side of their mouth while at the other side they're still talking about being tough on crime and all this sort of stuff. In the almost 20 years that I was in prison, I never saw the slightest shred of any sort of rehabilitation program whatsoever. And just right now, like in the state of California, for example, because of financial problems, because the economy, all the education problems, they are gone. I mean, you know, you have inmates sleeping in the hallways and they're not getting any programs at all. So now it's just kind of a, a joke. Thank you. Next question. Hi, I'm Michael Abrams. I'm a sophomore here at Brandeis. Uh, so my question is for Damien. Uh, in the program, I mentioned you studied Buddhism while you were in prison. I was just wondering if you could speak a bit about that. That seemed really interesting. Uh, it started when the day that I walked into the prison, um, another prisoner there gave me an envelope that had things in it like um, shaving cream, a razor, an ink pen, paper to write home to my family and let them know where I was. 
and he told me that he did that for every single person that came into the door to death row. Uh, eventually he was executed. And whenever he was, the only person who's allowed to be with you when you're executed is your spiritual advisor. His spiritual advisor um, was a Renzai Zen priest of the Japanese tradition of Buddhism. After he was executed, they allowed him to come onto death row and tell us what his last words were, um, what the execution was like. So he and I started talking, and then we started corresponding, writing back, writing back and forth to each other. Uh, one thing led to another, and eventually um, I had a Zen master in Japan who would come back and forth from Japan to the prison system. He couldn't speak English, and I couldn't speak Japanese, so he would always have to bring a translator with him. Uh, eventually, over the years that I was there, I received ordination in the Rinzai Zen tradition of Japanese Buddhism. It's the same tradition that used to train the samurai in ancient Japan. You know, there's almost uh, no, any sort of health care at all on death row. You know, it, so there were times when I was so sick that I literally did not think I was going to make it through the night. And meditation and energy work, things like Qigong and Reiki, those were the only things I had to get through those times. By the time I got out of prison, I was sitting anywhere from five to seven hours of meditation a day. Since I've been out, it's more like five to seven minutes a lot of times, just because life is so much faster and more hectic out here. And we've been sort of frantically scrambling in the past year and a half to get some sort of foundation under us and build some sort of life for ourselves. But that's one of the things I look forward to most in life, is being able to get back to that schedule, back to that discipline that I was doing in there, and being able to sit for uh, a long time. And, and that's one of the things I want to do with my life also. You know, I, I don't like being defined by this case. So what I would like to eventually do is have a small meditation center in Salem and be able to share with people the same things that I had to learn while I was in prison that helped get me through hard times. Share that with people who um, feel like they need something to help them get through. Thank you very much. I have a question for Lori. Um, you talked a little bit about the difficulties that you guys had in your marriage and have in your marriage. Um, and you married him while he was on death row, and you had to deal with both the issues of the case and the issues that he was having in prison, like his eyesight and his health issues. How did you cope, and how did you keep your hope going through that time? I'm extremely hard-headed. That's the first thing that must be known about me. And so I'm really stubborn. I had a great deal of support around me all the time. Um, my family was very supportive. My friends were supportive. The legal team was supportive, but Damien was probably, I mean, we, we talked daily. We had correspondence every single day. We wrote letters every day. We saw each other every week, and he was very, very strong. Whenever I would start to fail, he would be there for me and support me. He started failing, and thankfully I was in a position where I could help him, and we just kept that up. There were some really dark years, you know, when nothing was happening, um, but we managed to, we both, you know, had a spiritual practice that we... We uh, learned about, read the same books, we learned about things, we tried things, we, you know, it was just an ongoing learning experience, and and um, and I think that that's what it was, and we had a, a, an enormous love for one another. Thank you. Hi, this question is for Damien. Um, so, living in prison for 18 years, being an innocent man facing death, execution, um, I'm just wondering what kind of, um, advice or what what um, what you have to kind of tell us here sitting here listening to the story. It's not every day you get to meet someone who spent such a long time in prison. Um, you know, what, what do you have to, to say to us just in terms of how to go about living living a life? Really, I think what it all comes down to, it's, it sounds simple, but it's, it can be more difficult than it seems like it would be. You have to focus on what you want and not on what you don't want. You know, people would ask, after, we, after I first got out, or even while I was in, they would say, you know, did you ever think you were going to be executed? Did you ever stop to think, you know, what your last meal was going to be, what your last words were going to be? And the answer is no. You know, Lori and I would always constantly encourage each other, tell each other things. And, and one of those things is about how, you know, whenever they train race car drivers, they tell them, don't look at the wall. Look at your instrument panel. Look at the track. Look at the other drivers. But don't look at the wall. Because you're going to move in the direction that you focus your attention in. I didn't
didn't want to be executed, so we didn't think about it. And it's the same thing that we apply to our lives now. We don't spend our days dwelling on you know, slights or things that are going in directions we don't want them to go. Instead, we focus our attention, we focus all of our energy on what we want our life to be, and we move towards that. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is to me for Ronnie and Aaron. Um, what has been most satisfying about your involvement with this case? Well, mine's just simple. Sitting here. I mean, I think it just comes down to that. They're right here. Um, that, that's really, it's a very emotional question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a crybaby, so I'll... <laughs> 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 um, just working and, and with Lori and Damien, you know, the, 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 you know, the daily conversations um, that I spent with Lori, you know, talking about the case or struggling, uh, the people, you know, some of the people that we worked with were incredible. They're people that I, I cherish. Um, Damien's wisdom, which is kind of shocking to me because Lori and I would talk and, and, you know, about, and there were a lot of struggles legal struggles, public, uh, and I would be amazed by Damien's wisdom. It was like, it's one thing to be smart, it's another thing to have the sensibilities, to communicate from behind a prison wall to give us guidance and, and keep us on a straight and narrow. And that was uh, kind of an honor. And, and uh, for me to, to feel that I have, have meaning in life. And, and Laurie and Damien have given me meaning. You obviously bring a different lens, personal lens to the situation. Just curious, given that, what your views are on capital punishment, how they may have evolved over time, how you can potentially see them reverting if you start a family or through your own personal experiences across the, across the panel. And then finally, if someone were to challenge you to come up with an argument counter to what you believe, as it relates to capital punishment, could you do that and would you do that here? <laughs> I'm actually not, you know, I'm not against bad people dying. You know, I, I have no moral issue about capital punishment. Um, I think there are people out there that should be thrown off a bridge. Uh, you know, you can go down south and find a lot of them, you know, from the time of slavery. Uh, the state can't do it, uh, people in power can't do it, capital punishment, for as far as I'm concerned, has to be abolished because it's unfair. People that are in, on death row, as Damien said, are either crazy or driven crazy. It's a system that, that you know, depends, people aren't represented. People for capital crimes don't have representation. Our system cannot allow another person to be executed. Now, you know, there are people that Again, it should be thrown off the roof, but uh, our state can't do it. <laughs> well, I'm a reporter, so I wouldn't express <laughs> any. The only good thing I can say about death row is those are the cases that often get attention. I hate to say that's not a good thing. Um, that has been one of the reasons why I've been trying to look at individuals who've got life in prison, because um, I worry that there's a lot of people who are against the death penalty and they'll get involved with cases to get somebody off, off death row, but they won't care about the wrongfully convicted who got life in prison. So that's the only thing good I can think about it. You know. I think the death penalty will eventually be done away with, not through any you know, great leap in human consciousness or anything else, but I think it'll happen purely for financial reasons. You know, the economy, um, doing so bad, it costs a lot more to execute people than it does to keep them in prison. So I think eventually they'll end up doing away with it just because they don't want to spend the money that it costs. Uh, as for an argument for or against it, um, I don't care. You know, the, it, the system robbed me of so much time and so much life that it's the last thing in the world that you know, I want to sit around you know, spinning philosophy about. It's, uh, 
I guess I'd prefer to just deal with the concrete day-to-day -day situations than abstract philosophical concepts. We have time for one more question. Hi. Okay. So, as a possible future lawyer, uh, one of the things that really worries me most about this case is the fact that um, with this little evidence, with this little connection, three people could be convicted so easily and sit in jail for the better part of two decades. And I'm wondering if, uh, just general for anyone, if anyone has any ideas for how our legal system, which doesn't get to be broken, could be rectified. Is there any way that this could be changed so that stuff like um, events like this either don't happen or happen with much less frequency? I, I would say what I see with a, you know my my desk is full of letters from people who are in prison who want representation who who need help. I got a letter the other day. I, I and I don't open them. I feel terrible, I just can't bear. But I opened one, and it said two sentences. I'm on death row, can you please help me? And I was like, oh my god. But what I find is that people don't have representation. They don't have good lawyers. They had all the big law firms that have these pro bono departments, you know, they don't, and they don't look at wrongful convictions as much. So we need good lawyers, we need, you know, lawyers who care, and we need law firms who, who spend some more of their time representing people who, are, who have real problems in their case. What I find is, is that often the law firms want, you know, the perfect wrongful conviction. You know, they want a, you know, a white guy who happened to be crossing the street, but has a family, has never committed a crime, gets wrongfully convicted. We'll represent him. But, you know, the guy who grew up in the ghetto who has maybe a string of drug arrests who got wrongfully convicted, it's really hard to get representation to him or her. So as lawyers, you know, keep doing the right thing and, and encourage people to represent people, you know, who, because m most of these cases and wrongful convictions, you'll find terrible representation. And can I just add one other thing, which is the whole reason why we do these stories is, do pay attention to these stories. And if you feel strongly about something, what we're seeing is not fast enough, but we are seeing a change in the DA's offices. Um, there was a case where a guy got out of, um, Damon Thibodeau got out of Angola last summer. It took five years, but Paul Connick, who was um, a DA at Jefferson Parish, <laughs> agreed to take the case and investigate it on his own. And I mean, it, it took a lot of his defense attorneys. They had to trust the DA because they had to hand over all their files. But he did the right thing finally. It didn't take five years. And Damon Thibodeau walked out of prison, and he's been exonerated. Um, and so, if, you know, pay attention. Don't, when you always question when you read, maybe that person is guilty, but when you read this quick article and you say, oh yeah, you probably did, always question what's missing out of that article. What don't you know? Um, and, and, you know, if you have a chance to encourage a DA to take a look at these cases, I think it's going to take public interest in it. That's what it's going to be. Instead of making it worthwhile to, to advance in your career by covering up a bad case, it would be really great if someone, and I, that's, I have to tell you why I'm doing the, the Damon Thibodeau case. It's, you know, it's a pretty easy case too, he already walked out. I'm doing it because I want people to know Paul Connick did the right thing as a DA. And, and I'm gonna make him look right, um, because he did do the right thing. And if I put him up and he's on national television, other DAs may do that. Um, I did a story simply because there was a um, sheriff in um, Scott County, Missouri. He heard on the street that they put the wrong guy away. And I mean, this is who John Wayne always pretended he was in the movies. He is the real John <laughs> Wayne. Oh, he is. And I did this story. What was so fabulous about it is he got that guy out and then when the guy turned around and sued the state, because it had been his predecessor, the sheriff who put him away with bad evidence, he had to lose people in his office. And when I said that, oh my gosh, you know, you're, you're getting punished for this. He said, oh, you know, I had to do it. Um, he's a hero. And so um, that's what I think also has to be done, is that we have to make it worthwhile for 
DAs and cops to do the right thing, that they'll be advanced because we care, not just because we want a case solved and out of our eyesight. Well, I'm really sorry, but that's all the time we have. Um, I know it's been a great discussion, lots of great questions. I want to thank Damien and Laurie, Lonnie and Erin. for being in the audience. We hope that this discussion here has provided you with a deeper understanding of the issues involved with wrongful convictions in a country with over 2 million incarcerated citizens as of 2010. That's 0.7% of our population. And one would hope for an absolutely bulletproof judicial process. Yet, as we've learned tonight, it can be very easy to get somebody into prison it's not so easy to get them out. Um, our students at the Justice Brandeis Innocence Project know very well, as, as you have now heard tonight, what's involved in overturning a wrongful conviction. And I hope that the Brandeis students that have been here tonight will be inspired by what they've heard, will come learn about what we're doing at the Justice Brandeis Innocence Project, and maybe get involved. I also hope that, as Erin suggested, that when you hear about cases, when you hear about criminal prosecutions, that you look at things more closely, you ask questions, um, and are more fully informed about some of the issues that uh, we've touched on tonight. So I want to thank you all for coming, and uh, Damien will be in the back of the room. Uh, his book, Life After Death, is for sale. He's, he's here to sign books, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>